I'm Mike Boris, and this is Straight Talk. Toby Pierce, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thanks for having me, mate. Been Long a while. Time, yeah, totally, totally. Well, it's three years now. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when you walked in, I just thought, man, this guy put a bit of beef on. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't want to say you look fat or anything. I mean, like, I'm just, well, no, I mean, apart from you looking like a rot wheelie, you got black and tan on. I nearly wore the tan shoes, lucky. Yeah. We would have been right, both rocking the same gear. Yeah, but, well, that uh, means but, we, have, we both have really good taste. Yeah, I, I think I said previously, oh, they've got bloody shit taste. But uh, <laughs> but, but no, you, you, you look like you're bulked up. And, and I think that it's muscle. It looks like you're obviously doing a fair bit of training. Thanks, mate. Yeah, no, I mean uh, – well, I think as you know, obviously I'm on the other side of uh, on the other side of the first business deal now, so I'm a, a little bit more relaxed, a little less stressed, uh, got a little bit more time to go out of the gym. So, were you stressed? Yeah, well, running the business, like yeah. how stressful is it? Well, I mean, like most things, it goes through phases, right? Some things are you know not as good, some things are you know not so bad, but I think. Um, I think, you know, I'd suggest that, that a lot of the world kind of goes like, yeah, like be a founder, you know, be an entrepreneur, like it's awesome, it's great, you know, ditch the nine to five. And um, what they, a lot of the time I think a lot of people misunderstand is that especially when you're the founder or CEO, like everything is ultimately reliant on you, right? Yeah. It's this notion of uh, extreme accountability, which I think is awesome and I love it, but it doesn't mean I always love every minute of it, you know, like there's certainly some parts that are more difficult than others. That's a really interesting and probably really important point. Um, how long do you think... Well, how long were you guys doing it for? Well, I mean, properly, like, you know, on the app side, about five years. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've been in the fitness industry since 2012. So, you know, it's not nine, ten years worth of, you know, fitness-related business, obviously, to kind of get to, you know, where, where I ended up finishing. Do you think we have, as individuals, as founders, we might only have, like, ten years in this before mm. we need a big rest? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, I mean I'd, I'd probably respond to that by being – curious about well like what is it that actually like brings about the notion of being really drained you know, like what is it that actually does that and i think uh i mean obviously you know the high, high, certain high stress events business is not always positive you know the line's not always kind of you know firing upwards um but i mean like generically speaking yeah if you're if you're doing exactly the same thing it's not changing and evolving i think that gets hard um i think part of the you know positive part of our journey was that we yeah, every three or four years we had a pretty big innovation or iteration you know kind of occur in the journey um, and that that kept it pretty enjoyable, that's for sure. But I mean, the the latter part of the journey, um, you know, we had you know entered the pandemic, which was very hard for everybody in a lot of different ways. And you know, during that, we'd also kind of already been you know, entering this notion of like preparing to transact with the business, which is hard. And then obviously we got to the transaction, which is you know really hard really as hard. well, like a massive change. Um, so I mean. I'd probably say tired or, you know, needing a bit of a break is probably different to uh, you know, being like disengaged or needing to stop, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, like I, I, I've been through it sort of myself and I, I remember Gladwell's book talked about this whole concept of before you become expert in anything, you have to put in like 10,000 purposeful hours mm. of practice. Mm. And it wasn't his idea, by the way. It was mm. a hypothesis he borrowed from somewhere else. And I used to think to myself, well, that's, you know, it's good content for a book, you mm. know, people talk about it, Malk Global is who I'm talking about. Mm. And um, and then I calculated the amount of purposeful hours I probably spent in my wizard business mm. and it was around 10,000 hours. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anybody, even a, a person between t 10 and 20 mm. years of age, who can actually go much further than doing really – purposeful, concentrated, focused effort mm. on any one thing. It doesn't matter whether you're bored or, you know, it's not a matter of being physically uh, out of juice mm. because a 20-year-old's not out of juice. I think it's more about mental fatigue and creativity fatigue mm. and just the fatigue of dealing with investors, um, yeah. the fatigue of dealing with journalists, staff issues, etc. cetera. Mm. I wonder whether it is more than 10,000 hours in us. You know, like that could be a 10-year period. That's 1,000 mm. hours a year, which is, uh, you know, 20 solid hours a week, mm. purposeful hours. Yeah. Because you, you spend 20 hours, if you do 60 hours a week, mm. you're not going to do 60 purposeful hours. Oh, it's, it's not all focused effort. No, no, attention. no. You do no, 20 no. hard hours, a third mm. of it, and the other rest of it's talking shit. Yeah. I mean, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's it's infill stuff. Yeah, yeah, Did absolutely. you experience that? Oh, like for sure. Yeah, and even you know, on the 10,000 10, hours thing, like definitely I'm very bought into that philosophy. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I, I first heard about it in a book by Robert Green, which is called Mastery, right? Which is, you know, generically speaking and creating a framework for how do you go from being a beginner at something to being a master and you know it's the do your apprenticeship do your ten thousand hours there's all these you know great axioms that he mentions in there but then and, and in business in general like obviously you know i think i mean i i'd argue whether or not some people are doing much less than 20 hours a week of quality work and what i mean by that is you know uh, attending a meeting and not commenting on anything or um, you know, like being passive, you know, traveling, all those sorts of things, they don't obviously add up, they don't nope. account to the hours, you know. So if you think about it, it's like how many hours did you spend working on your business as opposed to just in it? Hmm. Um, and and early on, you know, when you have less capital, less resources, less, you know, you know team members and whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the CEO is the chief everything officer, yep. right? It's the jack of all trades. It's not really a chief executive officer yet. Um, you know, that transition happens over time. And so if at the beginning you're doing admin, you know, you're paying bills, writing job descriptions, hiring and firing people, whatever it might be, um, they're all important skills. And I think you need to, to build those skills as well. But, you know, if you really want to, you know, become proficient at your business or just even business in general, like the, you know, it requires specific focus. And if you think about the way that most founders actually get into business, well, you know, what, what is it really? Like a lot of the time it's someone who has a subject matter skill in a particular area and they're super passionate about it and they make a business out of it, right? Yeah. You know, or they've got pre-existing knowledge, right? And so, I mean, a simple example from my journey was being a subject matter expert in fitness or personal training means nothing in business. Like that skill doesn't like that. Being good at that and then registering a business like an ABN, Australian business number, getting a bank account, that doesn't all of a sudden make you good at business. Yep. You, 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 if you've spent 10,000 hours in fitness, now you have this wonderful opportunity to spend 10,000 hours in business. Yeah, you become know. good at business. Right. And in the same sense, you know, like if you've done 10,000 hours of working out, it's like, well, that's great. But working out is only one skill within the fitness thing, right? You have to understand – you know, programming, exercise selection, exercise technique, nutrition, business is no different. Like, yes, yeah, sitting in meetings, doing finance, that's great. There's some skills, but the list of skills is, you know, huge. You were a lawyer before this, weren't you? No, so I did a, I did a double degree in law and commerce. Yeah, but which, you didn't practice as a lawyer. No, I, I didn't even finish the double degrees. I dropped out just, well, probably a year and a half or, or something like that before finishing um, because I had, you know, this, the first version of this business. Um so I'd been doing some personal training and you've basically been doing law and commerce at university. But, um, and yeah, I, I, I don't think being a lawyer would have suited my personality. You know, I talked to you last time. I thought, it was mm. like, this guy knows everything about uh, the digital mediums and social media. Like uh, mm. you, you got pretty good at that stuff. Well, yeah. a big part of sweat was that. Yeah, Like sure. t- telling people a story. Dis- distribution. Yep. Distributing the story. Yeah. Um, is really, really important. Um, and I thought to myself, he must be spending a lot of time to get good at this. Like he must, because you know, you yeah. know, there's no real course in this stuff. Well, no, I mean, uh, there's there's bits now. There's yeah, a little yeah, bit of now. Life. There is, yeah. yeah. Go back to you know, go back to 2013, 2014, right? You know, advertising on social media is kind of new. You know, Instagram is really new. Like that, we're still talking like chronological, you know, uh, content distribution in the news feed, no videos, yeah. no adverts, no real direct messaging. You know, we were messaging people on different messaging platforms to talk to them from Instagram. You know, like we're yeah. talking like this is like the wild west, you know, like compared to what it is now. Um, you know, a big influencer had 10,000 fans. Like yeah. if you've got anything less than a million now, kind of, you yeah. know, are you, are you really – Yeah, a, are you serious? Are you really a serious size yeah. influencer? Not really. So early on, uh, I mean, I, I my initial thought process, you know, other than just constantly Googling acronyms and words to try and understand what they mean was uh, – so I said to myself, I'm like – where are the people in the world who are the best at this? Yeah, and when this, I'm saying, you know, you know, advertising or, you know, performance marketing, media buying, uh, you know, email and CRM marketing, which wasn't even really called that then, you know, um, uh, web, SEO, SEM, all these sorts of things. I'm like, wh- where are these people? And I came to this really quick conclusion um, that initially, so firstly, there wasn't really that many of them, you know, like we were still quite at the beginning of the days. And number one. Uh, number two, um, most of them were not in Australia. Yeah, and so early on in my career, for, for for the first probably five years, I would have spent nearly six months a year in America, just networking with different founders or people that were really, oh, you know, really? high up in these companies. Yeah, like meeting them because otherwise, you know, how how, do, how can I like benefit from all of the inefficiencies of their learning? How can I just 
get the value today, save my own time and effort, and then you know go and implement the value. And so, you know, early on, like a lot of our early on success, like came off the back of really being able to leverage you know organic social media, paid social media, and email marketing because not many people were really doing it you know well or at all at that time. Um, so that was kind of like my first obsession in business because it was the most obvious need. You know, like as in, I'm not going to go and figure out like how to do legal paperwork and recruitment or whatever. We had one employee. Yeah, yeah. I needed to find it's a way to yeah. I needed to find a way to generate revenue because we already had the product. The revenue was always going to come from distribution. Yep. And so, so yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to understand that. If you look the ten thousand hours, at the amount of time it takes to build a business and sell a business. By the end of it, and you said something very interesting back there, and I remember in my own experience with the sale of Wizard, which we sold to General Electric. Mm. It was sort of similar numbers to what you guys sold for, mm. but it was a fair while ago. We settled in uh, December 2004, mm-hmm. settled, got the money. We started the deal in February 2004. Mm-hmm. The deal was done. Like, you know, we agreed the, the terms. Yep. But what I found, one of the experiences I had is that it's easy for someone to say to you, look, I'll give you 100 bucks for something. Mm. And this is what I want. And by the way, there's a couple of conditions associated with it. Yep. You can't compete. Yeah, we need you to consult for a couple of years so we can, you know, transition everybody in and we don't mm. lose anyone, a few little bits and pieces. And you say, yeah, no worries. Then they say, but guess what? We now need to do due diligence. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I often say due diligence are two words for getting a discount, reducing the price. That, because uh, yeah. they spend, they must have spent six months of that seven-month period, eight-month period mm. um, trying to work out how to reduce the price. And what they do is they go look for risks. Mm. So they're inside your, they're in your, Home, mm. effectively. Mm. So you invite them looking in. for defaults and Correct. defects, and yeah. even if it's not a default, they want to try to convince you that it could potentially one day become or a problem. Or if you don't agree with it, mm. warrant it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Warranties give, and give me a warranty. W and I, W and I insurance. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so off we go. it's sort of like uh, it's quite an interesting thing. Like you get you're basically in, inviting them into your home and saying, just go around my house, find every defect you possibly can. It doesn't even matter if it's the smallest tube of paint or if something ha- hasn't happened. Hmm. And then give me your list and then because we agreed 100 bucks for the for the house, but give me the list and then we'll work out how do we yeah. reduce the 100 bucks by all those defects. Hmm. And by the way, Mark, if you don't agree on the defects and you, defect, then you better give me a warranty, hmm. like a guarantee hmm. that if that becomes a defect, well, you'll pay for I'll it. pay for it yeah. in due course. So <laughs> did you go through that? Absolutely, yeah. It is Fucking painful. So uh, we, we went through it twice because we, we were doing a, a separate uh, non-related transaction in 2019. So went through that process, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, um, for a variety of reasons that that particular transaction didn't, didn't come to fruition about 36 hours out from when we thought that it was going to come to fruition. So, I mean, that was a, uh, a character-building exercise, mm-hmm. that one. And then COVID hit and then we went through this process. And, uh, yeah, absolutely no different. Yeah, and it's at the end of the day, uh, the way I always looked at this, right, every single person that goes into a transaction of this type, no matter which role you're playing, either in business A or business B, buying or selling, whatever, everyone's afraid, mm. right? You know, if you're the seller, you're afraid that the deal is not going to happen. You're afraid that you're going to discount me or you're going to give me an absolutely excruciatingly painful, you know, borderline erroneous list of conditions that I have to agree to, which are unpalatable and therefore the deal won't happen. And so you're constantly in this, this fear loop, right? And then the person on the buying side, you know, all the people doing the due diligence work want to make sure that it's thorough and proper because they don't want to be found out that if in the future something happens, they, don't want to fuck it up. they made a mistake. Right. They just don't want to be responsible. Right. And then so then they give the, the DD information then to the people who are ultimately making the decision. And then, of course, all of those people are like, well, I don't want to make the wrong decision or well, the, the DD, but not, well, we'll just we'll bring the price down and we'll put these terms in to you know, protect us. And, Cover. Yeah. And the reality is, um, you know, whether you're buying a business for $10 million, $10 billion, whatever, there is no guarantees or protection. Like it's a judgment call. Like they're Correct. making a big judgment call. But um, you know the the it's the, the process is really funny because there's not many other types of uh, asset sale or acquisition that are like that. So if you use the house example you provided, right, we can do an auction because that's what happens with businesses. We do an auction, we bid, 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 and we agree a price and we just call it a hundred bucks, right? If you do this with a house, cool, hundred bucks, and they go, yep, cool, sign that, I'm going to walk through building inspection. Oh, 10k worth of paint needs to be done. 
some cracks here that we need to fix up. Oh, the pavers are moved. Maybe we should relay those. Oh, you know, the veranda needs one of the pillars replaced because it's, you know, I don't know, it's, it's falling apart or whatever. I need you to mow the lawn. You know, oh, that, that outdoor pl- uh, plumbing's not working. You're going to need to fix that. You know, all these things, right? But that doesn't happen. When you buy a house, you do the auction. Yep. And then you get the keys. That's called buy beware. You buy the joint? Correct, right. Cop it sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, and obviously, you know, when you're buying a business, presumably buying a business price is going to be bigger than you know than traditional house sales. So I can understand that. But it's a it's a very painful process to go through. And um, of course, every single time that happens, and you'd be able to relate to this, right? Price is a hundred bucks, ten days goes by. Oh maybe there's a bit of risk here in you know this area. Oh, five bucks. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. Another week goes by. Oh, we found another one. Here's another five bucks, right? But that's not even the the last part of it, though, right? Like once you get to the price, then there's the well, how are we going to do the payment? Yeah, yeah, we'll pay over time. Yeah, right. Or, and so mo- most deals leave some in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mo- most transactions look like some form of staged or conditional payment anyway. So the price it sets not necessarily always the one that's paid. Like almost all of the deals that I hear about and see happen that way. It's very very rarely is it just like here's ten bucks. Like, and, and lawyers, so I mean, mm. I mean, the people who they, they charge you for every. I mean, I'm not having a crack of lawyers, <laughs> but but like you've got to have them because yeah. the, the the buyer, the vendor, mm. will have you know one of the big firms mm. for sure, mm. and they just pile people on it left, right, and center. Like there'll mm. be you know ten ten lawyers on on their buy side. Yeah, would you think to yourself, I got to I'm gonna have to match them, so I'm gonna have to get a big firm or, <laughs> or a, a nah. I I I I never really kind of cared too much for that as bad as that sounds um and i don't mean that like by any disrespect to anyone i've ever dealt with but i'm also like i'm quite a i'm a bit of a utilitarian it's like whatever it is i need to achieve i'll get what i need but to you achieve always, that, huh? and that's it yeah for sure yeah for sure i mean to be honest really fortunate i think that uh yeah i think out of all the professional services that we got we actually like got quite lucky um over the period of the whole business journey absolutely have had some horrendous providers and partners that we work with but in particular for the transaction we were like very fortunate yeah, you know, I was like, yeah, I had my brother. I won't say the name. It was one of the big investment banks. He managed director of one of the big investment banks, like foreign investment banks in Australia, and he mm. had a whole team on it. You said like you had a previous buyer mm. who walked, okay, because yeah. something didn't work. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't work out some some issue. There was always, yeah. And with all these things, they come at you with about 30 issues and eventually get down to about two issues. There might be two mm. issues left. There's always two issues left. I don't yeah. know what the hell is, but yeah. there's always two or three. This new problem we've discovered. Yeah, and, and by the way, if you don't mm. agree with these, the way we're, we're going to walk. Mm. And that's the, always the, mm. what you don't want to hear, but that's what you're going to mm. hear every time. And sometimes <laughs> they walk, okay. And they're sometimes looking for a reason to walk, but other times they're looking for a reason for you to, just to bust you. Mm. And uh, I remember um, we had two issues mm-hmm. and um, they uh, they had two law firms, mm. two big Sydney law firms, well-known. So they said, let's have a meeting at 12 o'clock. The first shift of the lawyers of the purchaser came in at 12 and stayed to 6 p.m. <laughs> My lawyers are there, they're, you know, they're pretty tired. It was six hours and we couldn't resolve these two issues. Mm. That firm of lawyers left and the second firm came in at 6 p.m. I went, my God, what's going on The here? rotating evening yeah. shift. And I thought, well, how long am I going to be here? Well, we're there, we're there all night till 9 a.m. the next morning. But what happened was that uh, on the two issues, they were warranty issues. Mm. And a lot of times there's warranty about tax. Oh, yeah. Do you Absolutely. Have, a, do, have you paid all the tax for this company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you hell do you yeah. know? Like mm. you say, well, we paid all the taxes that we've been billed. But they said, well, what, but what about if there's a, a, an audit on you with – the tax office discovers something there that you don't know about. We mm. go, well, if they do, I don't know. Like, what do you say to that? Like, mm. so we had to give a tax warranty for seven years. Okay, yeah. we were negotiating on how far and how much the warranty mm. was for how much. And uh, at midnight, they said to me, "Well, our chairman, who was the chairman of the at the time of the world's largest company, the buyer was the mm. world's largest company, headquartered in Boston." wants to talk to Kerry Packer <laughs> about this warranty. And uh, and I said, well, no worries. And I thought, God, I thought they're bluffing mm. me. Mm. I said, and they said, if they can't resolve, those two can't resolve the warranty, that uh, they're going to walk. Mm. I said, no worries. Uh, I'll get Kerry. It's midnight. Like, yeah. I'm going to get Kerry. I'm going to wake him at midnight like you know, <laughs> way of midnight to talk to the chairman of the world's largest company out of Boston, whatever time it was there. Like, mm. 
And they said, yeah, well, we want to do it unless we can resolve this warranty here and now. Mm. So I grabbed hold of the, um, the Australian head of this particular buyer um, and we went into, in those days, it was a compactus room. You don't see them. Anymore. Oh, yeah. Walked yeah, into yeah, the compactus yeah. room. I said, well, uh, how do you get out of where everybody was? I walked into the compactus room, closed the door. I said, listen, we traded. We did a trade on something and I was prepared to meet halfway. And I said, because Kerry, I've spoken to him mm. and Kerry is available to talk to your chairman. Mm. And he must have been bluffing because – he pretty much shit himself because I said Kerry's enraged, by mm. the way, that I had to wake him mm. in the middle of the night mm. and he is ready to get stuck into your chairman. And he said, oh, oh no, no, no. He said, uh, well, yeah, let's just look at this warrant here. And mm. we, we did a deal in the compactus room mm. and Amazing. we walked out. We, and so I, but the funniest part about it is that when – so, you know, we had to do all the documentation, went through the 9 the next morning, we had a press conference, all that sort of stuff, and uh, it was announced. And then I rang Kerry. Because I hadn't rung him about meeting this mm. chairman. I didn't ring. I just lied. Um, that was bluff. <laughs> and uh, when I rang Kerry in the night, nine o'clock in the morning, he didn't sound too well and um, or too happy to hear from me at 9 a.m. But he knew the transaction had occurred because we told all these guys. Mm. And he said, son, I don't want you ever to gamble my money again. And I said, well, what do you mean? What do you gamble your money? He said, mm. well, that tactic of yours, that bluff, he said, there's no way I could have spoken to that chairman. Mm. He said, because right now I'm in St. Vincent's Hospital and I've been here for three days. Oh, no. Yeah, because he had kidney problems and heart problems. Oh. And he said, uh, I would not have been able to talk to anybody. He said, I was like dosed up in the hospital. Mm. He said, so next time before you go off and um, – Just check. Yeah, yeah just check. <laughs> but I did call their bluff. But, and, and that's the nature of it. Like so – and I, what you're saying is you experienced this process yeah. in the one that fell over. What about the deal that you did? Did they hold you to some to, – were the two or three – outstanding items that might have led them to walk? Yeah, I mean, look, we had some of those things that you mentioned as well. I think, um, yeah, we were going through a like an interesting transition with uh, like some of our like relationships with different organisations at the time. You mean suppliers? Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. And uh, like long story short, it was just one of these things where I didn't really think that it was a big deal. Like as I was, this is just like normal part of business. Um, uh, you know, the the CEO and founder of the company on the other side, and we're talking about a many, many, many billion dollar business on the other side. Um, and he's like, oh, you know, Toby, I think we should I think we should have a chat. Let's just pause everything for a second. And, of course, I'm sitting there being like, shit. Oh, this, no. Yeah, and so, so anyway, so, of course, I, I've, I've got a coach, like as a psychologist whatever, and I was like, oh, I call him up and I'm like, in 15 minutes' time, I've got a phone call. And I was like, I've been on phone calls like this before. His name's Travis. And I'm like, Trav. And I'm like, I've been on phone calls like this before. What the hell is going to happen, Trav? And he's like, Toby, he's like, you just got to, you know, just all the normal coaching things, right? You know, jump on the what call. What do you say? What do you say? Well, he's like, at the end of the day, he's like, you're great at your job. He's like, what's going to happen is going to happen. He's like, if you want to increase the likelihood that you're successful, then do the best possible job on the phone call. He's like, it's that simple. Because he's like, there's not like, there's no magic ten word sentence that's going to convert yeah, 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 yeah. someone into a you know an amazingly high performer. You know, if they weren't previously. So anyway, especially with fifteen minutes notice. Correct, right? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm you know, and I'm borderline, um, yeah, borderline kind of crapping myself if I'm honest, because I was a little bit like, well, I've been in, I've had like, I've been through this exact process before. The whole, hold on, let's just stop for a sec. Senior person on the other side calls, and the last time I had this conversation, yeah, the Deals deal off. was off, right? And so this is like, you know, almost like just, you know, 360 happening all over again. Um, and so anyway, yeah, long story short, jump on the phone call and this particular thing, you know, he's kind of going, he's like, look, you know, he's like, we're going to do the deal. We are, we are going to do the deal. And for one second I was like, oh, thank phew, God. Oh, yeah, thank God. And he's like, unless. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> anyway, and he's, he's like, unless, he's like, you know, you're going to have to get these contracts uh, sorted out in the next seven days. And I didn't respond like saying what I'm about to say now, but like in my head, my initial thought was, I'm like, this has been a 12 month project. Yeah, why ask me now? Yeah, like, uh, this, and we've probably got another three months. Anyway, um, what do you want to make sure there's continue, continuity of supply, something like that? Yeah, well, but basically it was, you know, any organization changing suppliers or even just changing supplier agreements is obviously a, it's a perceived risk, which I yep. think is fair. Yep. Like, I, I wouldn't debate that. Um, but it was more so uh, just like that that had been a known known 
yeah, you know, for the whole kind of process of the transaction. And so, obviously, you know, we get towards the end of it, and I'm kind of like, oh, you know, no one's really, no one's really said that this is a problem. So it's it's been, you know, um, provided as uh, information. So I'm assuming it's not. It was kind of like one of those last minute things that the whole like one or two yep. issues that comes up at the end. And anyway, and so like so naturally, um, yeah, when you're on a phone call like that, there's only one appropriate response. Absolutely, of course, I'll get that done for you before mm. the end of the week. And mm. this was one of those occasions where I was like, I have absolutely zero percent confidence that I'm going to complete that task <laughs> by the end of the week. But yeah, you know, like you got you got to kind of play the part. Um, uh, magically, it we did end up getting it done before the end of the week, and the deal did end up going through, obviously. And you know that was that was all great. But I mean, again, it's sort of. I think one of the things I said earlier, from the outside, everyone kind of gets really excited about yeah, the notion of being an entrepreneur and a founder and it's fun and it comes with all these perks. And just to be clear, I like I love that stuff. Like I live and I live and breathe for this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, but I don't wake up every day wanting to have one of those conversations. Yeah, like, you know, there's there's this uh, almost like continuous and sustained like existential threat complex that happens in business. There's yeah. always the next biggest, you know, barrier or problem you're dealing with and – when you're dealing with a, a transaction in particular, like as you know, it's like, well, every single conversation you have or piece of information you communicate or whatever, like that could be the end. It's a negotiation, everything. Yeah, yeah. And the more information you give them, mm-hmm. the more grounds for negotiation. Right. It's a bit like being cross-examined in in, in a court case. Mm. Um, you've got to keep your answers short mm. because the more you give the barrister, mm. the more armory you, you're lending him, letting mm-hmm. him have in relation to you. Because it took me quite a while to work this out. Like, because I'd already been through it three, two or three times before mm. when others had bought into my business, like in big investors like Kerry, et cetera. And, you know, there's this concept of people buying what they call buying warranties. Mm. Um, and uh, in other words, they pay a high price, but there's a whole lot of conditions associated with it. And if you don't meet any of those conditions, you you they can re- uh, reduce the price and the way yeah. they manage this is you said it earlier they structure the, the way they pay you they say mm. okay the price is 400 million dollars um we'll give you 100 now we'll give you another 100 years time and 100 a year after a year 100 mm. a year after that some long, let's assume that's the case but they've got this list of things that you have told them about the business mm. that the business is going to do it might be forecasts might mm. be all sorts of different things mm. and then you know in your deepest heart of hearts that at some stage they're going to say, well, that 200 we owe you, well, that's, we need to discuss that. Yeah, let's have a conversation. Yeah, and, and you're right. A lot of people sit back and go, wow, I lo- I, I'm going to do what Toby and Kayla did. I'm going to set the, run this business and I'm going to sell it to blah, blah, and look, they made this amount of money, I can do the same thing, which mm. by the way, I really hope people do think that. But they need to also have some reality. And I think also those that burden that you're talking about, that process you're talking about, mm it actually creates what I call deal fatigue. Oh, absolutely. Like it's – and you can't really compare this to – and I by, by no means mean this as a negative statement, but it's not really comparable to most normal working no. – um, you know, four forms of work or employment, right? Uh, so if you're a, you know, uh, been in the company for five years and for all intents and purposes you think the company's going to be there tomorrow – and you're pretty decent at your job. You 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 operate with a decent degree of certainty. Yep. You know, you don't wake up every day going like 10 years of my life, effort, energy, you know, all the sacrifices and all of the potential, you know, wealth or value that I've made. You don't wake up every morning going, that might not be there tomorrow. Yeah. The opportunity to manifest that might not be there tomorrow. And you know, I think a lot of people would say, oh, you know, but, 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 and that, and that's great. But like, but this is the reality, right? Yeah. You know, and so it's, you know, the equivalent scenario would need to be that an employee would need to go to work every day, wondering whether or not they're going to be there the next day, wondering whether or not they're going to get the next paycheck. Like it's a, it's a really hard, you know, thing to kind of conceptualize unless you've been in it. Yeah. And it's why, it's, I think it's why it's important for people like you to, tell the story um you know it's you know maybe i could tell the story too but like i'm yeah it's it's more it's more real from your point of, for you to tell the story because it's just happened to you mm. you've just gone through <clears> it <throat> and and you're not you're not my age you're much younger and for you to say there's a such a thing called deal fatigue yeah um it's it's a real thing there's just even just leadership fatigue yeah like like even more broadly and generally speaking like you know it's uh yeah, you know, and I don't mean that in the sense that you know you start with a tank and you kind of run it to zero. Like I don't mean that. It's like I think you know, 
you start the day and you know, when you use a bit of energy or something happens, you know, that goes down. And then when good things happen, the energy comes back up. Like it's a bit more dynamic. Yeah, but there's a real, there's a real, uh, you know, type of pressure and, and such, you know, that it is being in a leadership role and, you know, dealing with that. And again, like it comes with an amazing list of enjoyable things, but it, it, is, it is still quite hard. When you're doing the deal, the business is still running too. Mm. So well, you got you have to run the business, yeah. which is a full time role, and do the know, deal. Do the deal, and you're dealing with the pandemic, and 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 you know the list goes on. So you pretty much double your output. I I, I felt I found I double my output because the very thing that I was doing the deal on, I couldn't afford to let slip. Mm. That's the business mm. because as soon as the numbers start to slip or something happens, mm. they want to renegotiate. So I think probably, I mean, because one of the things that intrigued me about having a Magda today was, um, you know, to talk to someone else who had experienced, and there's not that many people, I guess, but uh, experienced one of the net effects of me was uh, I got divorced. Mm. But because for no reason, just that I, well, there's obviously a reason I neglected my, my yeah. family. I yeah. mean, because I, was getting home 11 o'clock every night, mm-hmm. um, was up at 6 in the morning. Some nights I slept at work. I slept on the mm. floor in my office, on the floor overnight. I yep. just slept there. I think it's a rite of passage actually. If it you sort of is, but, it's, yeah, but it's sort of, it nearly is whether I, I ruin a marriage or whether it just – But because I, I think the deal fatigue that we talked about, the leadership fatigue we talked about, mm. but I think relationship fatigue. Yeah. I um, mean uh, in your case it's probably even tougher in some respects because you're, you're in together. Mm. I mean it – at least my wife was in it. It was not in the in the relationship yeah. in the deal. Um, but she was. But she never got to see me. Like if yeah. I wasn't, if I wasn't doing getting home at eleven o'clock because I was working all day, I was on an airplane flying because you know mm. we used to issue bonds. I was on a, I was on a plane every six weeks. I fly to America, then to the UK, then to Europe. I'd do ten cities in each in in each country in mm. each area. And I'd be away for four weeks trying to raise money so I can lend it here in Australia. Mm. And I did that it, it, like just out, every month and a bit. And I did that for years and then I ran the business back here. And mm. uh, so I was never here. And then I branched in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, everywhere. So I was all over the joint. Mm. For me, it was ignorance because I didn't realise mm. what I was not attending to. I didn't realise yeah. I was neg- neglecting and fatiguing my whole family. Mm. Um, uh, not to mention the fact that I didn't spend enough time with my kids either. I mean, I mm. missed out on school leaving, football games, like just about everything. In hindsight, I, I can say that. I didn't realise it at the time. Did you experience the same stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think our situation was a little different. I mean, generically speaking, is is running a business a strain on your life in general and that includes your intimate relationship, um, your know, family, friends, you know, otherwise? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would – love to have a conversation with someone that says they've been through it and they had no problems with that. <laughs> like it'd, totally. be, it'd, be cur- it'd be curious, right? Um, I think for Kayla and I specifically, I mean, when we were actually going through the transaction, we'd already separated like quite some time before. Um, I think the notion of like working with your partner, you know, is it more or less difficult? Well, I mean, it depends on the nature of your work, right? I think Kay- Kayla and I were quite lucky in the sense that we had very, whilst we were in the business together, we had quite separate roles. Yeah, so she'd be out, you know, doing events and, you know, um, media relations and content creation and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was very much kind of like, you know, in the organization doing the day-to-day, like actually running the business. Um, so to be honest, like that was never never really a problem. Like I think she'd say the same. Like I don't think that no, was We're really not living in each other's pockets. So no, speak. no. I mean, you know, uh, we, we – and I think as well, like on the travel thing, if anything, it's probably a benefit. Most of the travel, I'd say probably eighty percent or more of the travel, we were traveling together. You know, so when you're in a happy relationship, like that's a good thing, right? Yep. In your case, you know, you're traveling alone and yeah. you know, going around the world. I think um, uh, going through the transaction at the like, as in because we've been separated, I can't remember for, for probably for over a year. I think at this point, when we were working on the on the transaction, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't really think in our case it, it actually changed a lot. To be honest, like I mean, we'd always been. Yeah, we'd always been quite like practical and you know commercial and and agreed on agreed on most you know, most like business facing things. Um, and so I think like going through the transaction, I mean, the only thing that was different for us obviously is that you know, in our particular transaction type, um, uh, we were in the business, we were doing quite separate things. You know, so the notion of our relationship to the business is obviously quite different. You know, I'm a um, you know, uh, an executive in the organization. Um, I've obviously stepped away recently. 
Um, but yeah, Kayla's, uh, you know, the most important talent. She's a gigantic marketing asset for the organization and is part of the reason that we were successful, right? Um, you know, so from that perspective, you know, the the tension was not actually necessarily between her and I and the deal. It was more so between, you know, um, each of us and individually what we needed, you know, with the acquirer at the time, how do we actually make the transaction, you know, work for both of us. Did the acquirer come back and say, what to do between you two? No, like that wasn't, again, I don't think it was really a problem. Like I think, I mean, I think going through the process and you know, initially meeting the first few investors, I think um, I think it was probably clear that our like, you know, our working and professional relationship was quite strong. So it didn't, it never, to be honest, it never really even came up as a conversation. I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that it really ever occurred to them that there was a problem because there was no signal that there was ever a relationship issue with us. What do you think it is? Mm that allowed you to convince investors, mm. whether they're buying the whole lot or just a small, yeah. lot, small amount, that your relationship was working. So like, what do yeah. you do to demonstrate that? Yeah. Well, do, and mean, did you talk about it to Kayla? Yeah, I mean, yeah, a little bit, but I mean, even more so, right? Like I'd just say, you know, something as simple as, you know, we're on a lot of like, you know, the investor phone calls together. You know, we talked through a lot of those conversations. We had a lot of those discussions. Um, you know, on quite a lot of them, we were sitting literally right next to each other. Like, so, you know, I think if you, I mean, to paint, like in an alternative picture, like what if I was an investor, I would not want to see, even forget if the founders are a couple, just pretend that, you know, there's a couple of like founding shareholders. If they were awkward with one another and debated with one another and disagreed or whatever, mm. that would probably send me a pretty concerning signal. If I was spook you. Yeah, if I was an acquirer, right? Especially, um, you know, even more so obviously if you're looking at it's like, oh, well, one or, one or more of you founding shareholders, we need to keep you here for however many years or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I mean, coming back to the whole warranties and indemnities thing, like that'd be that'd be concerning me as an investor for sure. But I think, I mean, honestly, like I I, you know, I consider myself pretty like lucky and grateful that we frankly it just it was never really a problem for us. You stayed mates. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we share a beautiful daughter. You know, she's, yeah, she's totally. three years old this month. Um, and we have a really, really good relationship in that regard. So I decided, I mean, I know – and I don't want to, I'm not like saying this to generalize and whatever it's like, but I know that that's not the case for everybody. Yeah. Like, and yeah, that's, that's certainly very sad, but it just, it wasn't really a problem in our particular circumstance. Do you at any stage reflect on the, on the business and the burdens of a business? Do you reflect on that as at any stage as mm. having affected your relationship with your wife, your ex-wife? Um, I should say, but Kayla yeah. is a shit yeah. word, ex-wife. Kayla. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, again, I'd probably answer that kind of, saying what I said before, I'd say it probably affected my life, you know, in a variety of ways mm. that, you know, you don't properly understand. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Like yeah, I mean yeah. that in all senses of the word. Um, I mean, you, even the, you know, the, the joking discussion we had at the beginning, you know, about, um, you know, that I'm training more and I'm fitter and healthier now. Like when you go through a, a journey that is, you know, so intense that it, I don't I don't think like saying that you work 40 hours or 60 hours or 80 or however many hours you want to say you work. I don't really think that the volume of hours isn't actually really the thing. It's the, uh, you know, it's the intensity yeah. of thought and the intensity of the emotions and the energy, right? You know, like I remember there'd be times like literally I'd, uh, you know, I've been training in the gym for the better part of 15 years. Yeah, I've been doing martial arts for you know, over half a decade. You know, and there'd be times during the particular experience early on during the transaction, whatever, I'd rock up to the gym and I'd be walking on the treadmill and I literally would be like exhausted walking at four kilometers per hour. That's like, slow. And, yeah. And I, yeah, that, that's slow. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, and I, and yeah, and this is at a point where like I would have considered myself pretty physically fit and strong, you know, I'd be, you know, deadlifting at, at least a couple hundred kilos, same squatting, whatever. Like I was a relatively strong guy. I'm not a powerlifter, but a relatively strong guy. Um, but there'd just be some days where you would be so mentally and emotionally drained. Like it would be, a, it would be a gigantic effort just to walk. Yeah. You know, like even other days, like your alarm will go off and I'm, I've always been a pretty decent morning person, but your alarm will go off and you just be like, I'm genuinely not sure if I can get out of bed. Like it's the emotional weight is so much more than, oh, I worked 80 hours, a hundred hours. If anything, I think that people sensationalize that because it sounds I agree. cool. You know, they're like, oh, I'm hustling. And I'm like, well, okay, awesome. And I wish you all the best and I hope that you're very successful. But it's like the, the amount that you work isn't actually the, the the problem. Yeah, and also I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you can make a $100 million company working 10 hours a week, 
Do it. Do it. Yeah. You know, like you, saying that you did it working 100 hours a week is great, but imagine if you did it in 90 or 80 or 50, yeah. you know, like. Please. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And you can relate to this. Yeah, right? yeah, like, totally. I think any business owner, whether they've exited, small, medium, large or otherwise, it doesn't matter. If you had this utopian world where you could do the same thing in 10% of the time, like absolutely you would, right? You know, but it's not, um, unfortunately, yeah, this notion of like working lots of hours misses the key point. But do you think you're like, do, I mean, I, I have this view. Uh, every human being, mm. no science attached to it, but every human has so many heartbeats in their heart for their life. Yeah. They have uh, so many brain cells that are going to die at a certain rate in their brain for their life. Mm. Um, they got, you know, everything else operates on a on a, a a depletion basis. So it's it's slowly depleting over time. We we shrink as we get older, you know, like in terms of height and, mm. and width and all those sorts of things. And I, th- I think also our, our energy is a depletion process so we we have a certain level of energy we probably reach a point in our life where we're optimized mm. and then that's probably when you're at nine or 20 or tw- in your early 20s and then from then on it slowly goes down and that energy is is limited and you can only apply that energy to some things some things will suck all the energy out of you mm. and i think when you build a business and it becomes as big as your business did mm. Then it will suck all the energy out of you. Yeah. And then I don't give a shit how strong you are, how <laughs> fit you are, how often you've been going to the gym for, how used to the gym are, how um uh, undaunting the gym process is for you. Mm. You'll you'll only be able to walk at four k's an hour mm. when you should be running at fourteen k's an hour. Right. And I that's the case. And which mm. means, in my case at least, I had no time to think about what amount of energy I was putting into my family. Mm. I just didn't have, and I, I didn't even have the energy to think about it. Yeah, it, it goes that far. Yeah. I, I was literally would come home at night and I would pass out in the bed, and then I would get up and uh, like early in the morning I go to the gym only because they kept me sane. Gym, could, well, it's all, it's it a sanity opinion, it's, thing. It's obligatory almost, right? Totally, it's part like, of work. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, yeah, obviously you hope that every day you're not walking at four k's an hour. You're, you're actually doing an ex, uh, some some legitimate exercise, but. I think it's um yeah for a variety of reasons whether it be yeah like mentally therapeutic or you know like obviously physiologically it's good for you generally speaking but I think being able to do that yeah for me was like mandatory right like if I wasn't training a lot I couldn't have done normal work let alone you know when the things kind of get to the extreme right it's just not not tenable and I think um I mean even uh, I mentioned before like on the notion of like having a coach and whatever I've, I always found this to be an interesting concept too right like people are so pent up on how how many hours can I work, right, to achieve whatever goal they want? And they're like, oh, I've got to take care of my body, so I'm going to go and exercise and hopefully people are trying to eat better and whatever as well. But the the, the actual, the rate limiter in business, more often than not, is actually your brain, right? Like yep. it's your mind yep. and your mindset, however you choose to, you know, frame that up, right? And that, I, I like definitely found that to be my issue. You know, could I physically show up to work and work long hours, whatever, absolutely, right? You know, but when did the problems come in? Well, the problems came in, it's like, oh, I've got to make heaps of really big decisions really quickly. Yeah, you know, I've got to deal with heaps of really stressful contention, you know, high contention conversations. Like um, that's the mental fatigue, you know, that I always like found more difficult. So like, you know, I, I, I can comfortably say I would have disproportionately, I would have invested at least 10 times as much money into trying to hone my mindset that I ever did, you know, my body or anything. Else. You mean like through coaches and reading? Oh, and, absolutely, and like, courses yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I would have spent, you know, going back to the, you know, the whole hours of input piece again. Like I would have comfortably spent more hours in the last five years. I would have spent far more hours on, you know, like learning, upskilling in coaching sessions, you know, going to seminars, meeting with people or whatever, than I would have in the gym. At maximum, I would have spent. I don't know, maybe an hour in the gym, four or five days a week, and then maybe, I don't know, five to eight hours of, you know, like martial arts, like jiu-jitsu during the week, which is still a fair bit, but like that would that would be the max, right? But I might be, you know, maybe I'd read two hours a day, you have a couple of hours a week of coaching calls with my coach or with other people. I'd network with you know, like three to five people per week at least, and each of those would be one hour. You know, like, and this would go on and on and on and on, right? It's never ending. Would you, you call know? that brain gym? Yeah, well, whatever, right? It's I try to be mentally fit. Yeah, yeah, that's right? what I'm saying. Brain yeah. gym, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of us, lot, not a lot of us, a lot of people sort of forget about that. They just think, mm. um, I go to work. Mm. Why isn't anything happening? Well, because your brain's not really ready for it. You know, like, uh, well, yeah, and the, and the whole efficiency thing before, like, you know, you make the joke about can you build a hundred million dollar company in ten hours a week? Um, it's a fascinating question in itself, but like, 
you know, one of the things I kind of always said to myself, and I think I mentioned earlier when we're talking about the marketing piece, like how much of the stuff that most business people do, how much of that stuff or how many of those problems that they face have never been solved? Mm. Not many of them. Mm. Most of them have been solved, yeah. right? Unless you're, you know, inventing the next silicon chip or you're, you know, Elon Musk trying to inhabit. Or you're building you know, a supercomputer Mars. or something. Right, whatever. Yeah. Quantum yeah. computing. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a very small list. Yeah, yeah totally. Like compared to the total list, yeah. there's a very small list of problems in the world and in business that have not been solved compared mm. to the ones that have been yeah. you know, solved in terms of what we're focusing on today. Because there's lots of questions we don't even know exist yet, mm. right? But like as it relates to business specifically, you know, when you're like, oh, like what to do about this people problem? Or what about this finance problem? Or like I've got to raise money. Or like, oh, how do I fix this marketing thing? It's like the answer exists probably somewhere to be honest it probably exists in many places and so if you're not investing in like mental upskilling or whatever like you can work a thousand hours a week obviously that's not possible but you can work as many hours a week as you want you could not sleep for the whole year but you're really just burning through time inefficiently because you haven't yet discovered that there's a more efficient way to think and solve the problem so efficiency is a big thing for you now you just mentioned mm. you did jujitsu or you mm. still do jujitsu yeah. Try, trying well, we, well, so trying. Uh, yeah okay but so but it's quite interesting that you do that because um, jiu-jitsu is a, quite a technical fighting method. Mm. Um, it's on the ground, yep. generally speaking. Most of it's on the ground. Um, very technical, but it is also about efficiency. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Somebody, when I say somebody, you know, either a Japanese person or someone mm. from Brazil, there's a, very, a whole lot of people are doing it, and some people from Australia for that matter, have worked out the, the most efficient ways to get out of a difficult position. Mm -hmm. um, they've worked out very efficient ways to resolve that. Does something like jujitsu actually help you in business, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I would simplify it like really easily, right, is it, it's this notion of like uh, in jujitsu specifically. So let's right? say I got you in the guard position and yeah. uh, my legs are sort right. of well, wrapped around the back of your what, hip there. What, what are the options and what are the, like, eh. what are the principles? Yeah. Right. And, and, and I think this is like, uh, you know, in business, like a lot of people forget when you're – yeah, I'm not saying that your emotions are kind of off when you're fighting, but like, you know, if you're just rolling around sparring with someone, like you're not really like most of the time, you're not really emotional about it. It's kind of like it's quite a flow-like, you know, environment to be in. Um, when you're in business, like your emotions are peaking all the time. And so, you know, let's use an example, right? You've got an employee, they work with you for five years, they're one of the first employees that you recruited. They are the nicest human in the world, always get you presents, always celebrating you, so happy, so, 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 so happy, right? But they're shit at their job. And no matter how hard you try, you've led the horse all the way to water, but it just won't drink. You just, you cannot, for the life of you, get them to perform, right? They've got to go. That's a really hard situation. And most people will kind of go, oh, but, 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 what do I do? Oh, yeah, and they'll empathize or they'll sympathize or about them or themselves. You know, there's this massive, you know, thought process to it. But without being kind of blunt, right, you know, like employment, you know, is the notion of, you know, uh, bringing a person who has knowledge, skills, capabilities into a business to complete tasks, right? Mm. In exchange for completing those tasks, you pay them a salary or uh, wage, give yep. or take, yep. right? Keeping it really simple here. And, if that person is not able to achieve the outcomes that are associated with the delivery of the uh, completion of the task that you've assigned them to over a period of time, if they're failing to do that, well, then they can't, you can't keep them in the business because then basically you're paying them to not deliver what the business needs. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, most commercial principles would suggest that that's not going to last very long for the business, right? So as the person in the decision-making decision, decision um, making seat, that's a very hard decision. You've got a friend here really nice human being they're so lovely they had so much positive emotional value to life but commercially it doesn't really make sense right that is the emotional drain hmm. right like that's what those type of decisions are what drains people you know wondering whether or not you're going to be able to pay bills next week or whatever because of cash flow because stock hasn't arrived yet whatever these things right like that's the drain you don't get that in many other areas of your life i practice that process of detaching yeah and I find it quite easy now because I've been doing it for so long. Well, the way you describe the employee, mm. or let's just call the person the colleague, mm. showed a fair amount of exercise of detachment, and you just looked at the the logic mm -hmm. as to what the deal is. Yeah. How hard is it, or was it, for you to master that process? Uh, Again, I might just kind of before yeah. answers. It's a bit like if I uh, get you in the guillotine. Yeah. 
and you've never been in the guillotine before. Yeah, you start freaking out. Yeah. I mean, my, my interesting experience was so understanding the logic and the principles was was actually like the easier part for me. Um, but to your point around you know, detachment, which I think is an interesting word here, right? Being able to separate the logic from the emotion one part and then obviously then being able to make a decision even though the emotion is still there and then proceed with the decision even though it's an incredibly uncomfortable experience you know uh logic part was never really super hard for me committing to this decision making thing you know i don't don't, honestly i don't think i ever really mastered that i got much better at it you know um but i think your mastery of that would be um you know feeling all of the discomfort with needing to make that decision and just instantly doing it anyway right i i I definitely can say that you know i probably never got to a point where it's just like instantaneous and i think that's because you know i mean i i mean saying that you struggle with compassion is an interesting sentence in itself right but like you know i i always you know really wanted to put myself in the other person's shoes and this and that and the other beforehand and you know had a had a couple of um I mean, probably a bad word in this particular context, but a couple of quite iconic, you know, relationship or employment breakdowns where I had to, you know, let people go through the journey. And like, yeah, there'd be times like I'd almost be in tears thinking about the conversation that I had to have because I was like, oh, you know, uh, person X has just got a loan for their new house. They've just had their third kid. The first two kids are just about to start at like in a private school college their partner doesn't work they're the key bread maker in their family you bastard i'm firing you you know like like that is i mean i'm i mean i again like i don't know if anyone find that conversation easy but i certainly you know didn't and i and there'd be times you know i'd delay is that because you got too close to them though well this is a thing right it's like you know but this this wasn't this particular example i wasn't really even close to this person it was more so just like on a human level i can understand that you have no awareness that we're about to have a conversation that's fundamentally going to complicate every aspect of your life and make you incredibly unhappy. But I need to have that conversation with you because I have an obligation to this business and its shareholders or whoever else it might be. You know, also, as a leader, you have an obligation to the rest of the team members. You've got 10 people on a team, nine are pulling their weight, one's not. The other nine are looking at you wondering why that person's still there. Yeah, you know, so there's all these stakeholders. It reflects badly on you. Uh, ab- absolutely. It sounds like to me you put yourself in their shoes. Does that mean um, your ability to empath- empathise, which, by mm. the way, is a really important uh, characteristic to run a business yeah. and, and to, to understand your audience and the whole lot of stuff. Yeah. But is that um, ability to empathise sort of misdirected? Because, as I said, mm. for me it's a matter of detaching yeah. and never being attached. Yeah, yep. And – at all mm. if, if possible mm. um, and keeping yourself away from any opportunity to to become attached mm. in other words be friendly yeah but step back away step back away from yeah, the, you know like stay uh, you're not going to get too close to me mm. sort of thing mm. because you're younger mm. more likely just to go in boots of all you're all friends or all mates and uh, i understand uh, your early life on for sure yeah early, early on it was that way i think uh, later on you know definitely a lot more kind of like I mean, professional is a strong word, yeah. right, obviously, but, you know, more, more corporate-like almost, yeah, yeah. if you will, as opposed to the whole, you know, I think a lot of a lot of uh, startups, you know, organisations early on, it's all like, you know, we're a family. Yeah, we're all hanging out yeah, in the garage yeah, together. Yeah, and we, we throw out all of these anecdotes, you know, that, oh, Bezos said that, you know, if you can't feed a team with two pizzas and the team is too big, you know, we, yeah. we go through all of these things, right, and, that, and that's awesome. Um, but if you're, you yeah, know, if you're going to be incredibly successful, it's likely that you're going to have more people. Not many companies get bought out for a billion dollars with 13 employees like Instagram. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so if we're running the assumption that you're going to have a bigger team, like unfortunately you can't operate like a family because the, one of the key distinctions between a family and a team, which is an organization or sports team, whatever, is, um, you know, that support in teams is largely predicated upon performance, whereas support in families, there, there is no need to perform. Yeah, in one sense, right? Yeah, we will love you regardless. Yeah, yeah. as my child or my brother, it's or unconditional. My parent, yeah, I will unconditionally love you. Um, but in an organization, you will not unconditionally be paid. Yeah, you will very much conditionally be yeah. paid. You will be conditionally blah blah blah, whatever the you know things are, right? Um, and so you know, going back to the point around you know like empathy and compassion and such, like uh, it's a super interesting thing, right? I mean, I'd love to be able to say, if I work with someone for five years and they left or I had to fire them or whatever, I would have hoped that I'd done a good enough job as a leader to build a relationship with them where we could have that conversation as adults. 
and that the relationship like between us would not end as a result of the employment ending. Yeah. But obviously that's there's a, that's a two way street. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, like I, I definitely found it difficult. Um, but I mean, I, I would gladly go out for a coffee or a drink or whatever with you know any of my previous employees. Um, but that ultimately requires them to still be you know happy to do so, right? If you set up a new business today, though, would you go about it a different way? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, mean, I, I advise, you know, mentor founders now. I've, I've got a few other business interests of my own and investments and such. Like, absolutely. Yeah. And like, I think the, I mean, w- one of the key things that occurs to me now, you know, being able to work with people and businesses from the other side of the fence is very much like, well, make sure your expectations are like incredibly clear with each person and each role and whatever they bring to business because very early on they're not and that's actually part of the problem you know like a lot of people end up feeling so emotionally hard done by because they're not really clear on what performance is and then that conversation happens and they're like oh but 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 and then the founder feels bad and then so you end up in this kind of cyclical conversation that never really resolves either in them keeping their job and performing or them leaving. It's this gray space in between where they're kind of here, but they're kind of not yeah, you really never really performing. told me. Yeah. You, you, didn't, you didn't really let me know about that. Um, yeah, and that's just obviously, I mean, that's obviously sophistication and management. Right? Mm. But the issue is that most people that are founding companies are first-time founders, right? Yeah. That's not 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 heaps of them have um, extensive management experience or if they do, it's, a, it's management experience but not – to the degree that is necessary. What do you do when you uh, make a whole lot of money? Uh, so, you know, you're not working in the business anymore because you've mm. recently uh, retired from the business. Yeah. Um, uh, you've got a new partner. I see on, I just, because I follow you on Instagram, I see mm. you got a new partner and uh, but go to the gym, as you said, <laughs> <laughs> training with a, uh, a lot less stress. You can, you mm. can go better than four Ks an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you do though to feed your, your need for speed? Mm. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but it's so good, you know, you can retire. No, that's, that's not That's all me. bullshit. Yeah, that's not me. But it's all bullshit. No, you're only a young me. man anyway for a start. Mm. I mean, um, you've got a little three-year-old girl, obviously you've got to spend time with her and yep. know, all that sort of stuff. But what what does Toby do now? Well, you know, so I'm, I'm four weeks out. Yeah. Like, so it was four weeks ago. So it's, well, it's, that's, what's taking so long? Uh, yeah. Well, exactly. Come on, what get on to it. What have I been doing? Um, so it's it's an interesting, uh, interesting transition. Yeah, so like, you know, four weeks ago, uh, you know, Friday, celebratory drinks with the team, say goodbye, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, it's a weekend. Weekend doesn't really feel real and official because it's a weekend. And then so Monday, right, right? And I do my normal daddy duties, you know, take Anna to daycare and whatever. And then I get home after having breakfast out. Hello. <laughs> sit, sitting on the couch and like, look at my calendar. Netflix. Yeah, looking around, whatever. Anyway, so, you know, the first week, like, there was definitely this. Uh, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, what happened? So I read 10 books. Right, I read 10 books. I trained heaps, you know, like uh, just did a whole bunch of other sort of like random bits and bobs. I'd recently moved house, so I had some house, like home stuff to do as well. And I get to the second week and I was like, no, oh, I started like learning about crypto and NFTs more and, you know, whatever, all that, just the interesting stuff. And I was like, okay, it's a couple of days. And so anyway, you get to this interesting point where you realize that you're going to fill the space anyway with something, right? And to your point, it's like, what does retirement really look like? It's just time filled not with work. Yeah. Time filled with alternative means, right? You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd already been doing this whole, like, work with uh, founders and advisory work for a while anyway. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'll amp it up a little bit and I'll do some investing and, you know, I've placed, placed some money with, um, you know, some different businesses and whatever. But it's an interesting thought because now I'm sitting here being like, well, if we just forget that the short term exists being a few weeks or months or whatever and I kind of go long term, I was like, What's that look like for me? Which begs the question, well, what am I missing now that I had previously, you know, really when I was, you know, on that journey with sweat, right? Like what what has actually missed, you know? And I was like, well, yeah, like having a problem to solve, like having a big chunky problem to solve and always having like a purpose to, you know, wake up and go work on is something that you probably don't really, to your point before about not reflecting on it while you're in it, mm-hmm. you don't realize while you're in it, like, oh, you're working your hours and dealing with stress and whatever, that's awesome. Like that that actual experience is quite awesome. Yeah, and you, for, for me and my personality, I'm not the whole I want to go and retire. Like I'm always a cool, like what's the next problem to solve? And I'm sitting here being like, well, okay, I need to find something that's really big and really complicated and it's going to contribute in a positive way to society. How, how the hell do you do that? You know, because all the skills that I've built up 
you know, largely over the last 10 years have basically been about building a organization, scaling an organization and managing, an organi- managing and selling an organization, which is very different to figuring out what is the idea. When I started the initial business, the idea to me was quite serendipitous. It was just like, oh, well, yep, these things come together. I'm at this point in time. This makes logical sense. Let's go. Yeah. But now, completely different person, completely different time, nearly a decade later. Do you have to retrain yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like absolutely. This is like, you know, part of the thing. So you're like, you know, uh, and, you know, kind of the, this statement, you know, like how do I, how do I make myself a novice every day? Because the only way I'm going to kind of stumble across new ideas and opportunities and whatever is by obviously being in places that I don't know everything or I'm not an expert in, right? Like, um, so I'm like, okay, well, how do I be a novice every day? Yeah, and that this was actually part of the reason why I started jujitsu, you know, quite a while ago now was because I was four or five years into the business journey and, you know, I was in a senior role, had a team and was in a leadership position and I was like, oh, you know, I was like, I'm – I'm not really like I'm. I don't really feel like I'm getting to be a beginner enough. This is quite yeah, comfortable, yeah. so it's stressful, but it's comfortable if that makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. a strange, you know, concept. You get comfortable in that stress. Yeah, and so then, so the notion before I was like, okay, I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to go. I always, you know, thought MMA was interesting, so I go to that. You know, and start up doing some jujitsu classes, and go up nearly a hundred kilos, and train with a friend of mine who's you know seventy five, eighty kilos, and. He thought he threw around like a rag doll. <sighs> Absolutely, How's yeah. But basically, but put me, put me unconscious nearly like a couple of times that in that session, and like, and you have this realization that like, no matter how good you are at something else, or how expert or um, yeah, erudite, erudite you might be over here, you are a beginner at everything else. Still, yeah, great. Pretty much, right? And so like that that was an incredibly good learning for me at the time. And so now that I'm kind of on the other side of the deal, I'm like, awesome. I'm like, I need to find that like novice type experience but i need to discover it in all these different types of businesses and areas of businesses and so like you know obviously the flavor of the month is you know the metaverse and nfts and crypto and whatever it's like how do i blend this notion of being a novice with 10 years of you know business experience to identify like where opportunities are going to present themselves and how do i get into the investor and founder community to you know help and contribute there and learn more as well right this is nearly like a fog that comes over you and makes Mm. you become defensive Mm. so you know like you make a lot of money you can turn defensive in mm. terms of what you're prepared well, to do. You're spending all this time. You spend ten years being defensive that you need to make the money. Yeah, and then as soon as you get it, then you want to spend all your time being defensive to not lose it. Correct, but, but it's the wrong mindset. So, so I was going to say you haven't yeah. gone through that process. Well, I, went, I went through the process for a short period of time, mm. um, but then I, I soon, within one year, I, I you know, I went the other way. I, mean, mm. I just said, sort of, "Fuck it, I'm just going to go back out and do what I've always done." Yep. But but this is the thing, right? Like it's a uh, I mean, most things in life, like they're imperfect processes, right? And we're building a business is imperfect. You know, investing money to make more money is is an imperfect process. I mean, even some of the most like prolific investment firms in the world, like they basically, you know, it's all a probability game. Yeah, but they lose yeah. someone else's money. Well, this, this, <laughs> this, yeah, actually, that's probably true. That's probably a good point. This is your but, money. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, if you look at the person, yeah, yeah. it's like you're, you're a professional investor. Yeah, yeah. It's what you do as totally. a job, right? Totally. Your money is someone else's. Like there is – like mistakes will be made. Totally. You know? Warren Buffett says mistakes yeah, will be totally. made, right? Like it's going to happen, you know? So you're not going to have 100% strike rate, but you don't need to. You, know, you only have to have a low strike rate, but obviously that those strikes, you know, be become returned. disproportionately positive. If that's your VC game, if you're yeah. more conservative, you know, put it in bonds or the ASX or whatever it is. Yeah, you but then do. you get, then you feel like you're missing out. Well, well, is that's it? not that's not really that much fun. But you also think to yourself, hang on, I could have made more money. What happens? I'm not well, through the process. It's FOMO, right? I, I went, I went and put a whole lot of money in different things, in the, you know, in the share market, whatever. And I thought, no, I just wanted a defensive return. Pay me a, you know, a, what they call the Oz yield, and let me give me six percent, fully franked or whatever it was. Mm. Then I had mates setting up businesses, you know, and, and uh, they, they were just screaming, uh, you know, value value accretion, like every year goes go mental. I thought, wait a minute, what, what am I doing? Um, I'm missing out on all this sort of mm. stuff, and I and I thought you're being too conservative, Mark. You're, you're yeah. playing defensive, um, and I'm never comfortable unless I'm actually taking a risk. Yeah, you, you and that's do, my personality. You got to kind of, I mean, I, it, I dislike I the saying, but like you, you need a risk it for the biscuit, yeah, right? Yeah. Like to a degree, yeah, yeah, like yeah. as in, I mean, you don't want to go out and be stupid and throw your money around, but like you need to. There needs to be some conservatism, kind of blended with some almost naive risk, you know. Like, and when you think about this, like a lot of the world's biggest companies have really been made off of quite a lot of naivety as in in the sense that people were naive enough to actually try 
you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. like, And that sounds kind of like. No, no, that's <coughs> right. It sounds, sounds kind of stupid. I say but, lucky, but lo- I was lucky to be naive. Yeah. Because I didn't know what I was get, getting myself into. Yeah, 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 correct. Yeah, and it's, uh, you need to, I mean, obviously there's a whole bunch of uh, research here and personality and whatever that's needed, but like, you know, the curiosity that's not kind of barred by too much knowledge, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you should say naive because a lot of people say to me, you know, in relation to my some of my successes, mind you, I've had plenty of the opposite, mm. um, but people don't ever tend to concentrate on my successes. But was there any luck involved? And I would say, of course there was luck. It is naivety. I was lucky that I didn't know a lot of stuff because I probably wouldn't have done a few mm. of the things that I went and did. Mm. And it was just my own sort of, you know, punishing personality that made me stay in it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, and just hang in there because I don't like being beaten. So I'll just stay in it no matter <laughs> what. But it was naivety that would have got me in there in the first place. And naivety um, that kept me um, reinvesting my time and effort and et cetera, mm. emotions into something. Um, I, I, and I'm, I, I, I'll be honest here, I think, I think I'm, much, I'm much better at that type of stuff than I am in investing in relationships. Mm. How about you? You, you've gone through this process. You're obviously very successful. You're good at this business risk taking because, you know, relationships are about mm. risk managing the risk as well. Um, how do you balance those two things up? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like are you better at one than the other or you're pretty good at both? Mm, to differentiate the two, I think like I think I mentioned earlier, like I always found the understanding of business and the logic and whatever was always a little bit easier. I think I always understood the relationships you know, like with the employees and whatever, but I think like putting the put, put, putting the required amount of energy, effort and time into it didn't come automatically to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, as you know, as I got like later in the piece, and even now, like working in other businesses that I own, you know, like it's a making decisions about you know, like strategy planning, data finance, whatever. Like that's quite intuitive to me. I don't really need to like consciously think or plan about that. Like, it, it's it's quite almost automatic. But when it comes to like the the people in the relationship side, I'm like, oh no, I need to stop here. I'm like, you know, do we have the right people? And am I building the right relationship with those people? And am I giving them enough time for what they need? Because it's not just about what I need, you know, and all these sorts of things. And like, I mean, I, I definitely found that more challenging because, um, yeah, I, I just like to work. Like I'm a real workhorse. Like I like to be in it. But like, like not not all people like to work that way. Some people want to sit down and chat and talk things through. Um, but that was something that I probably struggled with a little bit. But over time, certainly built the skill. Yeah. And your journey, you know, it was a long journey. Um, and it was, you know, stressful but fun too. Mm. I mean, it was, and uh, and it's probably you wouldn't change a thing. I'd say, um, it's not obviously your, your journey. Your overall journey is not finished, but you know that that sweat journey is finished. Yeah, you got paid for it. Um, you know, you're part of company from the joint. Um, you've maintained a good relationship with Kayla, and and obviously you've got a beautiful daughter. Yeah, you're you've got a new relationship now. Um, you're looking to doing different things. Mm. What two things could you? could we wrap with and mm. I'll share two with you as well. Mm. Yeah, great question. Really good question. And like it's, you know, the, the, it, it seems like a simple question and it's easy to ask, right? <laughs> right? As you know, but I think answering it's hard. I've been thinking about it for a lot longer than you probably have yeah. to. Well, in my three seconds of, uh, you know, thought, I think, uh, you know, I think the, I mean, the, broadly speaking, that whole topic about, you know, mental fitness, like I think that's a really undervalued your area uh, and what i'm saying that what i'm really meaning is and it's different things to different people but you know like do you, do you have a coach do you, are you meditating or journaling like what, what are you doing to keep your mental balance and i don't mean that as like a prescriptive thing that's the same for everybody because i think it's different from everybody but you know like how who or what is your resource to help you survive you know the emotional toll is probably you know yep. one thing um i think uh, probably not entirely unrelated, you know, to that. Um, you know, second point I'd probably say, uh, again, something similar that I kind of touched on before is this notion of like infinite learning. Like, and it's not, that's not my concept, you know, so I don't want to yeah, take yeah. like the credit for that. But yeah, the notion of infinite learning, which is basically that you're never not learning, you're just, you're just constantly consuming, you know, knowledge and content. Like, I think if you really want to, you know, have a, a journey in business that's uh, efficient um, and, hopefully not that painful and hopefully a little bit less stressful than it needs to be. Well, you know, learn what need, figure out what needs to be learned and then learn that from people or resources, you know, that exist that have kind of been there and done that, you know, like you don't need to go through the pain of discovering everything for the first time. You know, it's like you didn't go back to basics and build your first car. You bought your first car or your first bike, 
well, I'm sure more people, more people than not did, right? You know, um, you don't need to like learn all of those things for yourself. You don't need to discover all of those. A lot of this knowledge is purchasable or, you know, you can attain it, you know, through a network. So I would, I feel like that, that focus on constantly learning and then ultimately learning things that have already been solved. It's just a, ma- it, it, honestly, it feels like a bit of a cheat code. Like it's a bit of a shortcut, but a lot of people are quite convinced that the answers are not out there. And I think it's that notion of having that closed mindset or fixed mindset is what actually like prevents a lot of, you know, free, free success in some regard. Well, and I've thought about this a lot and, uh, and I've been asked a lot, but I've thought about it. I've had 20 years to think about it because I did my deal 20 years ago. <laughs> I'll be back in 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, we'll have a different conversation. It would be interesting then. if you tell me the same thing. So the two, the two main things that um, I've, I've, would say I got out of my ex- various experiences. Um, the first one is never go into as an entrepreneur. Now I'm talking about mm. never go into a business or commence a business or start a business up if you're looking to make money. Mm. So money is um, just the final outcome. Um, you know, like a, a, you know, you'd be able to look back on a ten years say I drew ten thousand dollars a year out of it, or mm. I sold it for whatever I sold it for. Mm. But never go in for that reason. I actually believe you should go in it for the purpose of learning. Mm. So I, you know, I'm much older than you and uh, for me learning is probably one of the most important mm. um, things we do in life. Yeah, likewise, I believe. It's so, so important. Um, it, is, it is really what life's about. Mm. Um, it's learning about relationships and learning about products or processes or distribution or people or it's all and you, you always got to be prepared to just continue to learn about what it, what it is that say – that particular business venture mm. is going to give to you as an experience. I think so. Learning is particularly important to me, that, and as that it has to be the major reason you go into the business. Mm. The second one for me is um, it's nothing to do with business, and uh, and it's only something I've worked out much later in my life. It's about to remember about those people who are important to you. Um, so make sure you know who they are, mm. you identify them, and you never abandon them during that period. Yeah. Agreed. So like your daughter in your case, in mm. my case, my sons, my grandson these mm. days, my dad who's still alive, my mom's not alive, but um, my brother, my sister, like, you know, you can't have too big a group, mm. <laughs> a couple of my friends I guess, but who are those people and how often do I communicate to them and, mm. and, and let them know what they mean in your life to you? Yeah, well, you get, you get an autopilot, right? Yeah, you totally. So you just, just think because they're the people mm. we take for granted. Sorry to point no, that. No, no, agree. Because when you're in in the deal, you know, when you're in the game, mm. you tend to think about, okay, who's cool? Who do I not have to worry about? Mm. Like who's sweet? Which is kind of a defensive negative mentality. It's stupid right? too yeah. when I think about it. Like, yeah. But actually they're the people who – worry about you the most and they mm. suffer the most mm. because – and you ultimately suffer because you lose contact. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think for me, you know, I've been through it too many times and I've been, you know, three times married, you know, and and really every time was because I forgot – I lost sight of those things. Mm. And uh, I'm not blaming myself for any, by any stretch of imagination but like, you know, I, I'm never going to lose sight of that stuff again. Mm. That – I know who my friends are yeah. and I'm friends and family obviously mm. um, and I know who they are and I think that when you get into the new deal, you can't spread yourself too thin. No. Make sure you look after them. Mm. Well, yeah. and, and, what, and the thing is as well, right, wh- whatever you think or however much time you think it's going to take you to complete a task, especially in business, it's almost always going to be multiples of that more. Yeah. Totally. Right? Yeah, so like you go into this thing and say, like, oh, I'll just give it a day a week <laughs> and – then I have all this time to like – it never, ever works out that way. And also and, – and not for all bad reason, for good reason too because if it's successful and it's doing well and you're winning and you want to win more, like you, you contribute more. But to your point, it's like, you know, having some of these rules in place, you know, like you know, much, much earlier on, like, you know, just even things like, you know, you'll be – I'll be home at, at 6 p.m. every single night for family dinner, Monday to Friday, non-negotiable. Mm. Don't, I don't like – I don't know, give a shit who you are or what meeting you want. I'm not doing it. That's family dinner, right? It's like, and yeah, once that's done, whatever it is, 7.30 or whatever, it's like, I'm going to the gym. I don't give a shit who you are or yeah. what you want to do. It's like, I'm going to the gym because I was training in the evening, so I didn't want to work out in the mornings. So I'd rather work in the mornings. Yeah, so like having a few of these like really basic rules in place, you know, like 
obviously they're different or whatever for me now, but it's like, you know, like for like Anna and I, for example, like one of the, one of the greatest things for me, for me, you know, now I take Anna out for a date every day before we go to daycare. So we always go to a breakfast cafe or go for a walk or do something, whatever it is, just her and I, keeping in mind she's nearly three and we can't really have proper conversations. It's mostly me listening to her talk about stars and unicorns and cute stuff. But, but it's the same thing, right? I'm like, I have all this time in the world, but I'm like, that's great. But no matter what changes in my life now, no matter what business I get involved in, what I do, it's like for me, like that's a that's a hard no. Like I don't care who you are. Yeah. On those days at that time, I'm yep. unavailable. Yep. As much as it sounds boring, these rules or these um, concepts within your life, mm. they're the sorts of things that I've learned, sort of, which is what my question was to you mm. was really. Mm. What are the rules? Yeah. And uh, they're two rules for me and we share the learning one. Mm. Um, and I, I actually think if you don't have a, a, a desire, like a, like I have a – not a passion, a, like mm. a like an insatiable desire to mm. learn about stuff. Mm. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. It's yeah. just generally speaking being curious. Like I mean Trav, like me and my coach before, like he said this thing to me once, which I just thought like it's, it's, it's such a simple way of thinking but like it completely changed the way I understood myself and then the way that I kind of interfaced with the world. He's like, Toby – Think of everything that you do, pretty much everything in life, especially everything in business, as an experiment. Mm. So, so like, you know, I have this other business you know, on the side, um, you know, that I've been working on for a couple of years at arm's distance. And he's like, you are in a fabulous opportunity right now to experiment how to grow a business. Mm. He's like, that's your experiment. And when we're going through the whole sweat transaction thing, he's like, this is an experiment for you to see based on the first time you did a transaction of this type that didn't work. Take your learnings from that, create your new hypothesis about what you need to do to deliver it, and then this is an experiment for you to deliver it. And if it doesn't work out, you won't be too disappointed because it's an experiment. And you learn and then you move yeah, on, right? Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it's fascinating because, I mean, I'm, I've always been familiar with this notion of thought experiments, which is just you create like a lab in your mind about something and you try to break the process in your own mind. But then like using real-world situations in your life as an experiment as well is, is actually quite interesting, you know, and – and I started to realize subconsciously I'd almost done this for a long time. I was like, oh, I'll create my training program this way to see if I can get this result. You know, or I'll approach my jiu-jitsu training this way to see if I can have better retention and application of you know, skill. Or I'm going to try and see if I can learn this piece of music on the piano in this way or whatever it might be. And I was like, sure. I was like, that's actually been like a invisible key to some success I've had in certain areas of my life. And now I kind of go, before I'm going to do anything, I'm like, oh, what's my hypothesis here? You know, like how do I actually think this is going to play out and – it's just a really interesting way of thinking. And I, it's funny, I was sitting in that very seat there, um, for someone who loves jiu-jitsu, um, I had John Kavanagh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, about uh, a month or so ago. And um, I'm invested in business with him and uh, mm. other some other people. So, But we're talking about he, – he was here to launch that business, the, the, the change of name for the business. He's mm. come to Australia for that reason. But he wrote a book called um, Winning or Learning. Mm. And uh, – and he basically, his hypothesis is we never lose. Yeah, you only learn, right? Yeah. And if you go right. about, it's a bit like what your coach said. Mm. Um, if you go about your life, yeah, win's a win, good, tick, mm. right? But if, but I never lose. I just learn from that. Mm. And then I can go on. I'm never going to be so disappointed that it's going to knock me you're about. you're never devastated. And, and this is the thing, like, I, again, you know, the kind of great learning was, like, if we view things as winning and losing, it's like that means that, you know, and you're never ever really that excited about it. your wins, as dumb as that totally, sounds. Totally, you know, 100%. Win, you move on, right? But like then from a loss perspective, it's like it's disproportionately devastating. Yeah. You know, like it, it's almost like soul destroying because we have this pent-up expectation. But, yeah, changing the, you know, your kind of philosophy or perspective on that to being like, well, that it's that didn't work. It's not I didn't lose. It's that approach didn't work. Yeah, yeah. and you, and on that basis, you never lose. Correct. Because I'm always gaining. Mm. I'm either winning because the transaction's done. Yeah. Or I'm learning something, which means I'm winning. Mm. I've improved my life. Yep. So winning or learning, and uh, it's been f been fantastic to catch up with you. It's uh, you know, I said when you first came in, um, how well you look, how healthy mm. you look. But what's <laughs> interesting is that, uh, you know, you're not you're only a young guy. Um, and you've done you've done something amazing in such a short period of time for a young man. But what you've um, the wisdom that you seem to have obtained at such a young age is quite amazing too. So I congratulate no, thanks, That's what I want to congratulate you on. No, thank you, you very did, much. You did the deal. That's great. But the wisdom that you seem to have mm. is amazing for someone your age. So well done. No, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Honestly, I consider that to be probably one of the biggest compliments I've ever received because it's not free, mm. right? Like you don't get your knowledge and experience of free. It's quite painful, frankly. Great. Yeah. So no, thank you very much. Wisdom's about 
the best thing we can ever get. Mm. Well done. No, thank you. Toby Pierce. Good to catch up, mate. Thanks a lot.